free men who are Gentile, I mean, Jewish men had different expectations on them, but Gentile men had a lot of social freedom in terms of what they could do. And then in terms of how they treated their spouse, their wife, they were expected to provide for her needs and to train her in whatever family trade or business there was, but they weren't expected to be kind necessarily. Our modern notion of love and what it means to love someone and treat someone in light of that, that is a pretty rare notion in the ancient world. It was more of a practical, you know, I'll give you what you need. But if a man was angry, something like domestic abuse, that's what we would call it. I mean, that was very common and socially accepted. So both in private spaces and public spaces, like in a marketplace, a man could treat his wife or his kids how he wished. And hardly anyone would have judged that in a negative way. It's time for another episode of The Sean Tabbitt Show, a podcast where I connect you with thought leaders from across the globe, digging into some of my favorite topics like personal development, marketing, spirituality, and pretty much any other shiny object that happens to catch my attention. Today, my special guest is Holly Beers, and we're going to be discussing her brand new book, A Week in the Life of a Greco-Roman Woman. Holly, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Well, let's kick off our conversation today with a bit of what we might call the Holly Beers origin story. For those encountering you for the very first time, I want them to learn a little bit about you. So first off, let's start with your academic background. What threw you into the whole realm of academic studies? Ooh, that's a good question. I graduated from a Christian college in the Minneapolis area. I'm from Minnesota. And honestly, I had a faculty member in college who encouraged me to pursue the academic life. He said that I had what it took to perform well and do it well. And he encouraged me and I still know him today. So that started my journey. I'm a Minnesota native. So which college in Minnesota? It's called North Central University. It's a Pentecostal school. All right. Very cool. And then in terms of your later studies and your current role at Westmont College, like what's your area of expertise or specialty? I'm a New Testament scholar. Some of my specialty areas are the use of the Old Testament in the New Testament. So, you know, what is Paul doing when he quotes from Deuteronomy in one of his letters? What does that mean? What's his point? Those kinds of questions. Luke and Acts, that's a specialty area of mine. Most scholars think the same person wrote Luke and Acts, though Acts really is my favorite. It's my favorite book, definitely. Those are a couple of my specialty areas and interest areas. There's also a growing field of Pentecostal scholarship that I I'm going to be contributing to shortly. So that's exciting. That is very exciting. Next, let's get into the story behind the book. So I'm curious to hear how you got involved in this fabulous series. This, I believe, is like the fifth or sixth volume in the series. It is. Yes. I had heard of the series and I'd read the first one that Ben Witherington wrote. He's famous. So, you know, everyone knows him. And I'd read that and enjoyed it. But then several years ago, Dan Reed, who was an editor at IVP University Press, He was at Westmont where I teach and he came and sat in my office and asked if I'd heard of the series. I said I had. He said they were looking for someone to write one on a woman. And he said, what do you think about that? And I said, oh, I I mean, initially I'm interested, but I'd have to think about it. I mean, what kind of story are you looking for? So that really began my process where I started to imagine what it could look like to tell a story about a woman, not a wealthy woman, not an elite woman, but a more sort of average woman in the ancient world. And I decided, yes, I care about this. I want to do this. What I love about the series is it's immersive. It's almost like you're getting to view that world in kind of this 3D sort of living color experience between the story and the call out teaching elements throughout the book. So if you're listening and you've never checked out any of the books in the A Week in the Life series, I can't recommend them enough. They're very, very fabulous reading. What I'm curious about from you though is Holly, in terms of the writing experience, I'm assuming the majority of what you'd written previous to this was nonfiction and very academic. So what was it like for you to transition into sort of fiction author mode? Because that's actually a very different skill set. It is very different. Dan had asked me that when we talked about me writing this book. And I said, I have to be honest, I've never written anything that's a fiction based kind of book. I've read probably thousands of novels in my life because that's what I do for fun. I'm a total nerdy reader kind of person but I've never written one. I do know the kind of novel that I like to read. I like first person novels where you get to see it from the main character's eyes and you're even in their head. But I said to him, you know, I'll give it a shot. And at first it was kind of rough, to be honest. I felt like it was really stilted and awkward, but 
if I'm going to be honest, I started praying. I just told a friend this. I started praying every time I sat down to write. And I honestly, I would say, Spirit of God, you know this is outside of what I typically do and what I feel like I'm good at. Please help me. Help me to see the story and then I can tell it. It's like I was watching it happen in my imagination and then I was describing what I saw as I typed. I feel like I have a co-author. It's not just <laughs> me and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> That's right. One thing I'm always curious to ask, especially for somebody who takes that first fictional writing journey, did you find as you went along that the characters kind of took on a life of their own doing things you weren't expecting? Yes, that's definitely true. As I was imagining well, well, I hope I imagined well, I was definitely imagining, <laughs> I felt like I could anticipate in ways that my characters would act. And then sometimes they would act a little out of character in my mind too. And I thought, oh, well, maybe I should include that. Because people do that too, where they do things that surprise us. So definitely. Next, I'd love for you to just to introduce us to a few of the characters that we're going to meet in the book, maybe just the key or core characters, and how are they representative of the women you really wanted to profile in this book? That's a good question. My main characters are all female. My protagonist is a woman. Her name's Anthea, and she's married and has a kid, but her friends, I really tried to center the story on her female friendships as well. So she has a friend named Phoebe and one named Eutaxia. And then she meets a woman named Claudia who becomes a friend. And then she has a, another friend, Dorema, and I'm not going to tell you what happens to her and to read the book. I really wanted those women to give a taste of what it could have looked like for women in the ancient world to get married. I mean, women didn't have a lot of choice about that. That was set up primarily through families and fathers. The men in the family would have had a lot of choice. But what kinds of work the women did besides having babies and raising kids Women were almost always involved in family trades or whatever the sort of family or even larger kinship group did. So my women do those kinds of tasks as well. They sell fish in the marketplace. They spin and weave wool. They mend clothing. There are other smaller female characters in the book who sell all kinds of things in the marketplace. So I wanted to show women out and about doing the kinds of tasks that we're pretty confident most women would have done. And then I wanted to show female friendships, how in the midst of the busyness of life and how hard life was for most people, I really think the limited evidence that we have points to this, that women would have been an important social support for each other. Usually not crossing social classes, usually within the same kind of social class, but women would have been there for each other and assisted each other with, with all kinds of things, including raising kids and delivering babies. One thing I will say, I finished reading the book on a plane yesterday and the way you tell this story, it's raw, it's gritty, it's a little painful at times, not in the sense that it's written poorly, just your heart breaks for some of the things that your characters are going through. Yet, I really feel like you captured the heart of what it was like for these characters, were they real people to have lived in that time. And I think for people who haven't done much reading in this area, some of the things they're going to encounter in your book are going to be crazy surprising to them. Yeah. Would love to have you talk to us a little bit about infant exposure, infanticide, abortion, like what was going on at that time in terms of either trying to get rid of a baby or a, you didn't want a baby? What was kind of the norm? In the broader Greco-Roman world, it was pretty common to try to limit family size, mostly for practical reasons. Another mouth to feed was not good news for most people. I mean, for the very top level elites, it was fine. But for most people, it would have been a struggle. So there really isn't such a thing as contraception. They had things they tried, but nothing really worked. And as far as we can tell, there wasn't a good understanding of how a woman's cycle worked or how pregnancy even occurred. So women got pregnant all the time who weren't necessarily intending to. And we do know that in the ancient world, there were methods for abortion. There were things women tried to take. There were more dangerous methods of inserting things up into a woman, but that was obviously dangerous for the mother. So practically what a lot of women would have ended up doing is having the baby, even if it was unwanted, and then it would be exposed. In other words, it would be left out in a space. Often in a city, there were known spaces where people left babies they didn't want. So that if someone else decided they wanted, you could go and collect a child, for example, or sometimes animals would get to those children. In rural areas, they would often just be left out in the wilderness, these unwanted babies. So we know that happened. There's a lot of evidence for it in historical record. And we also know that infanticide was common where when the baby was born, a midwife would just kill the baby. Very common practice across all kinds of cultures, though not for Jews. Jews were famous in the ancient world for 
raising all the children born to them. And people made fun of them for that, which is quite interesting. And the Christians followed in that process and were also known for opposing these kinds of practices. I mean, life was hard. There was a preference for male children. Most people had a hard time feeding their families. Life was honestly just not valuable in the same way that we at least say it is today. So many kids, even the ones who survived, would have died before they turned five. So babies just aren't worth a lot from a social kind of societal perspective. And ancient societies did what they felt like they could and they needed to, to manage that. Another thing that people might be surprised from in the story is what was the norm as far as treatment of spouses and and abuse? And I think you do a really good job of illustrating that. So again, what was kind of the normal practice Mm -hmm. at that time? We have a lot of evidence for this. The ancient world in the Mediterranean sort of geographical area was patriarchal. That's broadly known. So men are in charge and they rule all the sort of official systems, including marriage. So Free men who are Gentile, I mean, Jewish men had different expectations on them, but Gentile men had a lot of social freedom in terms of what they could do. And then in terms of how they treated their spouse, their wife, they were expected to provide for her needs and to train her in whatever family trade or business there was, but they weren't expected to be kind necessarily. Our modern notion of love and what it means to love someone and treat someone in light of that, that is a pretty rare notion in the ancient world. It was more of a practical, you know, I'll give you what you need. But if a man was angry, something like domestic abuse, that's what we would call it. I mean, that was very common and socially accepted. So both in private spaces and public spaces, like in a marketplace, a man could treat his wife or his kids how he wished. And hardly anyone would have judged that in a negative way. I think another intriguing element of the book is sort of the way you illustrate the shared living spaces, the kind of latrines, the bathing in public. As far as people kind of being all on top of each other in so many different ways, what was that like? Oh, I tell my students all the time that our notion of privacy is basically <laughs> a modern, Western, and privileged notion of privacy. It's a sign of privilege to be able to have private spaces because it means that you have the money to construct those spaces and to enforce those boundaries. So in the ancient world, almost everyone would have lived with extended family groups. Now, in rural areas, this would have probably been centered around the men's family. So a wife would have married in and then ended up living in a kind of combined space with her in-laws, basically in that extended family. In my book, because it's set in a city and that we know that there was some basically social fragmentation, I guess I could call it, where families didn't always live together in the, in the same way, just in the same way that that happens in cities today where families sometimes get separated. I have my main character living with her husband and child and some cousins but then her father is in the home as well and her aunt. So it's a mixed family group in that way. And they sleep there on the floor. They eat there. There is a pot that you can use, a chamber pot, to go to the bathroom when you're in the space, but there isn't any kind of running water or the kind of modern notions of kitchen facilities or anything. In rural spaces in the ancient world, people would have bathed and gone to the bathroom just outside of the kind of main living space area. But in cities, we know that the Romans constructed public latrines, a public toilet system, and the Romans loved to bathe. And so there were these public baths, but you did that with people. So no dividers between toilet (laughs) seats and those public latrines. You just sat next to whoever and people bathed together too publicly. The evidence points to this. Men, women, kids, everybody just kind of in the water all together, often having conversations, even people eating and snacking. It's kind of entertaining to think about. Also probably a little scary, though, for us in our context. (laughs) Especially the scenes you have in the bathhouses where it really is like, oh, this is so different from anything I think any of us would have ever imagined. In terms of the reader's experience with this book, when you think of the reader kind of getting to that last page or closing that back flap, what's the message you hope they've heard loud and clear? If they only take away one thing, what do you hope they've gotten out of the book? Can I have two things? (laughs) You may. You may. You're the special guest. My first is I really want them to feel like they have a deeper, richer understanding of what life in the ancient world would have been like. And they feel it. It's like it's a visceral thing. And you've actually given me signs that you've had that experience as we've been talking. So that's encouraging for me. I want people to notice the differences and to really resonate with that in powerful ways and say, wow, life, I feel that I'm human. They're human, but their life was so different than mine. So that's my first hope. And my second one is I want people to have a compelling sense 
of how subversive Jesus and his first followers were. Jesus is so countercultural and challenging and his first followers would have been too. So many of the social norms, the expectations for how people behaved and what you were supposed to care about, who you were supposed to hang out with and how you were supposed to treat people. So many of those things, Jesus and his first followers, they challenged those and said, no, our God, the God who actually made everything, he wants us to change how we're doing these things. He has a better plan for humanity. So I really want people to see how surprising Jesus and his first followers would have been. I tell my students all the time, it makes no sense from an ancient perspective to understand why anyone would follow a guy who got crucified by the Romans. Being crucified by the Romans was the worst thing that could happen to anyone. It was deeply shameful. In other words, publicly humiliating. There's just no reason why anyone would think that was a good idea. And yet people did. They were compelled by him and by his resurrection. I mean, that's the reason why people, starting with the Jews and then so many non-Jews, decided, yes, like this is worth it. It would have been a huge social risk in the ancient world to follow Jesus. So I love that. One last question. We'll go off script for a minute, so to speak. Did you have a little bit of fear and trepidation kind of casting Paul into your story? Because that's one of the things I've thought about this series as I see people writing Jesus into their story and other prominent biblical characters. I'm like, oh my, how would it be to try to represent them properly? Oh yes, definitely. I mean, people have, there are such varied opinions of what Paul was like. I teach an introduction to New Testament class every semester, and then I've taught in, more specifically in Paul's letters in detail too. And I wanted Paul's passion to come through. He's such a passionate guy, even emotional, which by the way, would have been surprising for men in the ancient world to be that way publicly. He cares so much about Jesus and the mission of Jesus that comes through. And I think that he was a joyful guy. I mean, he certainly writes about joy and having that in all circumstances. So when I wrote him, in my imagination, he laughs a lot and he enjoys people and he compels people to follow Jesus. So I definitely wrote him that way. And I hope that people, even if they have a different view in their mind of who Paul is and what he was like, I hope they can appreciate at least some of the characteristics I gave him. (laughs) Holly, for the listeners who want to connect with you, find out more about your work and your books, where can we find you on the web? I'm on Westmont's website. I have a faculty page. That's probably the first easiest step for people. All right. And like we do with every episode, we'll have detailed links in the show notes, a place where you can learn more about Holly and links to where you can pick up a copy of the book as well. It's time to bring this episode of the Sean Tabbit Show to a close. Many thanks for being a part of my conversation with Holly Beers. Once again, our book today was A Week in the Life of a Greco-Roman Woman. For more on Holly, a great place to start is the Westmont website. You can find that over at westmont.edu. And Holly, I just want to say thanks so much for sharing with us today. It's been a great pleasure and an honor to have you on the show. Well, thank you. The honor is mine. 